Since the People's Republic of China's founding in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party has prioritized nationalism and conformity. The collectivist mindset creates a supportive society that is willing to sacrifice for the greater good of the country. In order to maintain unity, the CCP has taken an approach to integrate China's 55 ethnic groups into the Han Chinese majority. Such methods are devastating to minority culture, as these groups are targeted and assimilated through recent government policies. One of the groups that are most discriminated against are the Uyghurs. 12 million Turkic Muslims living in what is now recognized as the Xinjiang Autonomous Region in Northwest China. Despite the decades of Uyghur oppression, the international press has only started to recognize this issue recently. Good morning, my name is Ashley Ding, and today I'll be discussing Uyghur oppression in China. My research question is, since the 1960s, to what extent has the Chinese government's suppression of Uyghur culture negatively affected cultural distinctiveness in Xinjiang? And my research question is in the larger context of cultural synchrony, as Michelle Gelfand of the Department of Psychology at the University of Maryland states that cultural synchrony discourages minority perspectives and reduces the desire to argue for one's own unique opinion. And my argument is, since the 1960s, the Chinese government's suppression of Uyghur culture negatively affects cultural distinctiveness in Xinjiang through religious oppression, state-sponsored education, internet surveillance, and employment discrimination. First, on religious intolerance. This is the primary motive for the CCP to oppress the Uyghurs. Alicia Maloche and Rebecca Clothey of the Department of Global Studies at the University of Maryland summarized that China's purpose for restrictions is to prevent radical Islam in Xinjiang, which the government assumes to have fueled ethnic strife. However, the Uyghurs are not classified as a terrorist group whatsoever, and this is simply an excuse for the government to impose restrictions. And in the 1960s, known as the Cultural Revolution, mosques were destroyed and transformed into Communist Party buildings. That's why, starting from 1960, you see this decrease. Now, in recent years, you also see that we're on a low again with the election of the president of Xi Jinping. Additionally, women are not allowed to wear veils, men cannot have beards, and Uyghurs are not allowed to fast during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, according to Clothing and Cuckoo 3. The solution is that China is a party to several human, human rights treaties, including the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and the Convention Against Torture that have all called upon China to end these abuses and have put pressure on the government. However, Lisa Reinsberg of the International Justice Resource Center finds that China has not accepted any individual complaint proceedings under these treaties and instead has criticized the experts instead of actually addressing the issue now onto state-sponsored education. In 2000, the CCP established the Xinjiang Class, a program that funds Uyghur students to attend school in predominantly Han populated cities in Eastern China. Now the CCP covering all of the costs for these Uyghur students to have an education may seem like a good thing. However, the Uyghur language has been completely removed from the school's curriculum. As a result, Uyghur students speak more Chinese than Uyghur and sometimes cannot even read or write Uyghur at all and this negatively affects their own understanding of their culture because language is intrinsic to one's own expression. And the Chinese government has taken another approach to send more than a million Uyghurs to so-called re-education camps. And as you see in this chart from 2016, 2018, the number of confirmed camps shown in green has been on a rapid increase. And within these camps, they are forced to learn the Chinese language chant the Chinese hymn and praise the president of China, Xi Jinping. And this is a modern cultural genocide occurring right now. The solution is to end mass extrajudicial attention by targeted sanctions on senior officials responsible for the abuse in Xinjiang, according to Xiu Zhongxu. And the example is the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, which imposes sanctions on entities and individuals responsible for the actions committed in Xinjiang. However, the limitation is that there is no guarantee that Uyghur freedoms will improve, and China may just resort to other means of income from countries that have simply not sanctioned them. Now, let's move on to internet surveillance. After riots in Yurumqi in 2009, Xinjiang's internet was shut down for 10 months and dozens of Uyghur leaders were arrested for supposedly leaking state secrets, according to Rebecca Clothey. And since then, the CCP has obtained a tighter grip on internet control. 
as shown in this chart from 2021, almost 12 million phone call duration and parties are recorded and almost 11 million text messages are monitored constantly to make sure these Uyghurs are not expressing their own culture on the internet. And the solution would be to disguise online posts as many Uyghurs have actually taken upon themselves to express their cultural ideas through revealed languages such as sarcasm, humor, and references to traditional Uyghur sayings and folk heroes. The limitation, however, is that the wording needs to be extremely specific in order to avoid censoring. This censoring would include keyword censoring, so they purposely block expressions that include like Uyghur, the word Uyghur in it, and the CCP is unpredictable. We never know if they'll change their keyword censoring policies to completely erase Uyghurs on the internet entirely. Lastly, on forced labor. The Chinese government puts Uyghurs into forced labor so they can integrate with the rest of the working society in China. And the global war on terror has actually justified the use of Uyghurs in forced labor. They've been forced to work for international brands such as Nike, Apple, and Zara. So shown in this picture, they're manufacturing clothing, and this is most likely for a large international company. The solution is that it's taken through social media. Hashtag forced labor fashion is a campaign that CSW from 2020 started, and millions of people have taken it Thousands, if not millions of people have taken it online to condemn China for their actions and end this abuse in Xinjiang. However, the limitation is that large corporations such as Apple specifically benefit from Uyghur labor and may move towards preventing any sort of legislation from being passed. So we don't know if this social media activism will actually turn out to work in the end. This is my work cited. Thank you. Any questions? I do have two questions for you. Yes. First up, how valuable and reliable were the sources that you use, and then how do you know? I use a variety of sources within this presentation, mostly academic journals, because they purposely stemmed from the history of China and the motives. So from 1960s, I used many academic journals to report on the atrocities that the Chinese government has taken. For example, the Cultural Revolution source was actually taken from an academic journal, but I also use news sources because this gives me the most recent information. For example, the Human Rights Policy Act, which I mentioned in my one of my solutions, was taken from a news source because it was actually signed recently and imposes sanctions on individuals responsible for the restrictions in Xinjiang. Okay, and, and if you had more time, what additional research would you conduct on this issue? I mainly focused on the Uyghurs and the Chinese government in this presentation, but I really want to know what impact does the restrictions have on the viewpoints of the Chinese population. So I did conduct some research on this, but I decided not to actually include it because it was very limited. They interviewed one person in China and asked them what they thought about the oppression, and they stated that it's good because it maintains unity, like the collectivist mindset that I stated at the beginning, but I really want more information on what the entire Chinese population thinks as a whole of this issue. We're done.